Dr. Paul Jockin. I am an associate professor of literature here at Lawrence Tech. Uh, I am one of the co-developers, coordinators, directors of the Humanity and Technology Lecture Series with Dr. Franco Delogu, who sends his regrets. He's not able to join us today. Um, we have had a number of select, uh, successful collaborations with COAD in the past, and it's really exciting to be able to continue that collaboration with this event. And uh, we look forward to having another collaborative talk uh, in the spring, so please stay tuned for that. We have several partners and friends uh, who support this series. Uh, the one I would like to underline, especially today, is the Michigan Humanities Council, uh, who've provided funding for our talks in the past, and they are partially funding this event. I'm also particularly grateful for the College of Arts and Sciences for uh, helping us to supplement the cost uh, coverage that we needed for today's talk. Um, a couple logistical matters before I uh, introduce our speaker. Um, we are going to keep the doors open to try to keep things safe. We ask that folks keep their masks up. We ask that you keep your phone on silent. If you have to slip out due to classes or things like that, please do so as quietly as possible. The event will wrap up around 1.45, so if you have a 2 o'clock talk, uh, lecture you have to attend, you will have plenty of time to get there. For safety, what we're going to do for Q&A is um, we're, I'm going to, we'll ask you to just raise your hand when you're called on to answer, ask a question. Uh, just say it kind of robustly, and Dr. Slater will repeat, repeat it in the mic so that everybody can hear it. Uh, we think that's probably the best way to handle uh, questions and answers in this particular crowd. Uh, that said, it is a real pleasure to introduce Dr. Avery Slater to the Lawrence Tech community. Um, I have a personal connection to Avery. We first met quite a while ago, <laughs> maybe like 12 or 13 years ago, in a poetic seminar at the University of Washington. And I was immediately impressed by her intelligence and her broad educational background. She could make these references from the classical world to the contemporary world with ease. Uh, and I didn't know at the time, because it was a graduate seminar, that she was actually an undergraduate student. Um, so when I found that out, I was even more impressed. We lost track of each other for a number of years and then uh, reconnected through a shared interest in the relationship between literature and science, particularly mid-20th century theories of information and informatics um, known as cybernetics. And Dr. Slater has done a lot of work in that field. Um, since then, we've just had these multiple collaborations that have come about, which have been really exciting. I um, was privileged enough to edit one of her chapters in a forthcoming collection in which she takes up contemporary bio art, so art that uses biological organisms as their medium, and uh, engages theories of life and remediation in that piece. It's, it's really brilliant, so watch for that when it comes out. Uh, in addition to the Bachelor of Arts that she received from the University of Washington, Dr. Slater has received a Master of Philosophy in Critical Theory and the History and Philosophy of Science from the University of Cambridge, as well as MA and PhD degrees in English Literature from Cornell University. She is currently an Assistant Professor of English at the University of Toronto, where her research investigates the reconceptualization of human and non-human forms of language following the rise of information and computational technology with specific attention to the history of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Her book project, Apparatus Poetics, explores how mid-20th century poets revise and reinvent modernist theories of poetic process in response to emerging technologies of language. She spent the academic year of 2016 and 2017 at the University of Pennsylvania's Penn Humanities Forum, researching the literary um, and philosophical context of post-war machine translation. She has also held fellowships in the Society for the Humanities at Cornell and the University of Texas at Austin. Her work has appeared in a number of leading journals, including New Literary History, Critical Inquiry, Simploque, Cultural Critique, American Literature, and Transformations, the Journal of Media, Culture, and Technology. And she's uh, appeared in a number of edited collections, and I think these titles really speak to the breadth of her work, and you can see why we were interested in bringing her here for the series. Uh, Saturation and Elemental po uh, po Politics, which came out from Duke UP, The Oxford, ha Oxford Handbook of Ethics of AI, Trauma and Literature in an Age of Globalization, and The Palgrave Handbook of 20th and 21st Century Literature and Science. Her talk today is entitled AI and Creativity. Please join me in welcoming her. Hello, 
everyone. Thank you so much to Paul for such a kind introduction. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today. Uh, I hope everyone's doing well. I work in Canada, but I'm a US citizen and I haven't been back to the United States since before the pandemic. So this is the first time I'm coming back to the United States. I'm happy to be here, um, however temporarily. Uh, and um, <coughs> really happy to be part of this series. So I hope we'll have a good conversation today about AI and creativity. I have a feeling people in this room may have some interesting ideas about it. Um, so I prepared a series of remarks for today on this topic of really you know, ongoing interest to me, AI and creativity. Or put another way, the problem of artificially intelligent creativity AI creativity is both an emerging field and an old one. It's an aspect of designing computation that's been there since the very beginning. So for the next 45 minutes or so, I wanna present to you some of the perplexities that I find arising from this problem of artificially intelligent creativity. This problem connects, I believe, to some larger issues around art and to productivity, to property, and the proprietary, and to how technology has been intervening in the field of human creativity for some time now. As someone who works in the field of AI and society, and who comes at this endeavor from a perspective shaped not only by the history of science and technology, but also the literary humanities, the question of artificially intelligent creativity leads me back to the question of creativity in general. Can we understand recognize or successfully design creative artificial intelligence without asking ourselves first some difficult, confounding, even awkward questions about our own creativity or what I would rather term organically intelligent creativity. How much do we understand our own creativity? How good are we at recognizing the creativity in others? In raising the problem of creative AI, the discussion usually turns around whether or not the art or the artifact that AI produces should be designated as creative. Are they novel enough, but not too novel, too weird? Are they intentional? Are they expressive? Expressive of what? These questions are generally posed as though it's we humans who will decide something about the nature of the producer, in this case, the AI agent and not about the artifacts themselves. I propose that we stop asking such questions for the time being and look simply at the artifacts. Not only that, we should also look at the context in which AI artifacts are received as creative rather than just how are they produced. So for me, the word that designates the space on the spectrum between creation and production is generation. Generation is a helpful term in that it indicates something has begun, rather than something has come into being from out of the void as we might think of with creation. Compared to the term production, generation implies something more original or even gift-like. With production, we know all the components and the processes. With generation, we have some idea about the process, but there's a certain amount of chance, opacity, surprise. One of the ideas driving AI research in the field of creativity is that such research might help us understand our own creativity. What will it help us understand? A related question I wanna think about here is, what's the value of machinic creativity? And I put machinic in parentheses because we have to think about creativity more generally as well. Is creativity's value something we can take for granted? In order to think about value, some believe we have to think how to quantify creativity especially when thinking about the economic value. Some of the experiments that I've looked at and that I wanna to present today, in fact, used Turing tests to try to figure out the answers to AI's creativity. Using the setup of the Turing test or can this computer fool humans into believing it's human, but testing not in the traditional sense consciousness, but rather the genuineness of its creativity. What's the source of machine at creativity, you can ask. Where have the AI agents derived the kind of grounding data or raw materials for their creativity? The final question I wanna address 
which surrounds AI research, is, is machine creativity communicating? So to begin, what's the value of creativity? A rhetoric around creativity as an index of innovation is something that one sees everywhere. It has been linked to the discourse of disruption. And because of that, you now see creativity as a value touted by the business world. I just pulled a few examples here. Uh, creative consultancy, creative disruption, creativity that can be managed, that can be fostered, that can be sitting around politely in the workplace, at the conference table, or giggling its innovative ideas across a transparent plate glass board in open plan offices. My own view is that machinic creativity, and in fact all creativity, proposes uh, to problematize the way that we think about producing. So that's my definition of creativity, a problematization of productivity itself. What it means to produce. It's not simply producing. Creativity doesn't itemize expenses, save receipts, or deliver billable hours. It's a problem. It makes us stop and think about what we're doing and how we're doing it. There is a powerful idea these days, however, that creativity is a necessary part, an integral component of the continued creation of value under capitalism. A related idea is that industry disruptions necessarily will have to mobilize creativity in order to bring about lucrative disruptions. Given this state of affairs and this rhetoric, it becomes no surprise that AI creativity is something big tech concerns are talking about these days, including IBM, for one example, here talking about the quest for AI creativity. AI creativity can be found rather frequently in the news. It makes a lot of headlines, and we're going to talk about some of those today. But you know, the interesting thing about the creative process, it does not quite unfold in the manner of a quest. In pulling images to illustrate corporate rhetoric concerning creativity, I found this, and I thought it was a pretty good illustration. Uh, the creative process is not something you can easily track. It's not something we can quantify very easily anyway. When it comes to the creative process between the start and the end, there's a lot of noise. So this story came to my attention um, a little earlier this year. Uh, Jack Kelly, a staff writer at Forbes, wrote a piece on Silicon Valley tech employees who were microdosing hallucinogenic mushrooms. Um, and that was to increase their disruptive potential and to try to stay relevant. So I'm gonna ground us in this rhetoric at the beginning here because otherwise AI creativity might sound like something sublime or obscure, a transcendental question. Rather, AI creativity does also have real economic dimensions. In this talk, I wanna point out how AI creativity is interacting with the economic dimension of the world of art, particularly. In fact, the value of creativity, art and its social economic value is a long drawn out strand that derives from modernist and contemporary art. One example of, shall we say, disruption in the field of art, art's economic value and technology's mediation of this field comes from an example that probably many of you know, um, Beeple. Beeple drew um, a fine enough series of not so great, but fine drawings every day for 5,000 days. These drawings combined into a collage group sold this year at a Christie's auction. Christie's will figure several times in this talk. Um, it's a famous art auction house. Uh, for $69 million. This is the largest amount ever paid for art in this particular format, namely NFT art. Non-fungible token, NFT. A digital artwork that can be held uniquely by the owner, not transferred or reproduced, thus having the economic value of a painting that one can hoard in one's art vault. This auction by Christie's of Beeple's art shows that the value of creativity it's not something that is ever really quite obvious or predictable. If you think about the modernist artist Kazimir Malevich's Black Square from 1915, for example, and compare this with Beeple, it's right to ask, well, could we have imagined that this Black Square from 1915 would sell for $60 million at a Christie's auction in 2008? This brings me to another artwork of particular relevance to the subject of AI cre and creativity. That's one I've written about also. Um, this artwork was auctioned by Christie's also a few, a few years ago in 2018. It made international headlines because this portrait of Edmond de Bellamy was sold um, in October of 2018 for 
$432,000. This portrait was produced not by an artist, but by an artist collective, and that collective used an algorithm within the context of a generative adversarial network to produce the art. Well, let me draw your attention to the author's signature. Um, this, as you can see, the signature line under this painting is the formula used by the Generative Adversarial Network, or GAN, GAN. In fact, there's a whole family of portraits produced by this same GAN. Um, here you can see uh, La Famille de Bellamy, a prolific GAN, uh, and perhaps gifted with immortality as it lives long enough to paint so many generations of this same family. This algorithmically produced art derives first and foremost from the work of computer scientist Ian Goodfellow et al., who first engineered GANs, or generative adversarial networks, as a special form of neural network in 2014. Yet people were quick to notice that the specific formula and code used to design the de Bellamy GAN was not written by the art collective, but rather had been written by a teenager named Robbie Barrett. Barrett had put this code out online as open source. And you know you can see these paintings, uh, they're very similar in their aesthetic. The art collective had written to Barrett to say they wanted to use his code, but then they went on to sell the artwork for half a million dollars, um, not any of which they seemed to have shared with Barrett, and they didn't want to share the publicity either. This was discovered by online sleuths. So that raises some questions about who or what has produced something that's authentic, original, and worth the kind of scarcity price that half a million dollars indicates. In the space of AI artwork then, let's turn to some experiments on artistic perception, how we humans perceive art's creativity, and the Turing test of art made by AI. Here's an experiment by El Gamel et al. So just take a look for a second at these 24 different works of art. So which of these artworks were produced by an AI? Let's take a moment, see if you can guess. And this study was published in 2017, so just before the de Bellamy Christie's auction. Okay, can you find a guess? Does anyone want to guess? Yes. This one. Second one? You are correct. And they all were. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry, but it was a trick question, and you're right, though. That was produced by an AI. They're all produced by an AI, and uh, part of the you know, way they, they developed this publicity is that they wanted you to say, well, I think I've seen that one, and I think I've seen that one, and I think I've seen but I haven't seen that one, right? Uh, and so then you think that one is the, is the AI. Um, you can see in, this, in these paintings, if you look at them, the last 100 years, though, of Western painting behind these pictures, all of which cluster around the styles of abstract impressionism, expressionism, and suprematism, how does this AI agent generate these paintings? Okay, so some of you maybe know how this works, but for those of you who don't, very briefly, the researchers perform a modification here on the classic GAN to make a CAN, or CAN, Creative Adversarial Network. Okay, so in a generative adversarial network, the network is partitioned into two halves. One side, the generator produces artifacts, um, for example, art, and tries to fool the other half of the network into thinking that the artifact that it produced is real, like real art. The other half of the network, called the discriminator, is trained on a data set of real artifacts, so like real faces, real art. The discriminator um, here was trained on actually existing Western art, and it makes judgments about what is and is not a real artwork. Well, Elgamel um, et al.'s work uh, in creating this CAN, uh, they make the discriminator and the generator work together, but with conflicting purposes for the generator, or two different purposes. So in this CAN, I'm saying CAN because if I say a CAN network, it could sound like Andy Warhol made the, <laughs> the uh, network. Okay, in the CAN, the generator side um, has to get the discriminator to declare that its productions are artworks, just like in a normal CAN but it also has to try to get the discriminator accurately to describe what style the network is producing something in. So the generator is thus trying to fool the discriminator, saying not only is this art real, but this art is in 
such and such style, say impressionism, et cetera, abstract expressionism, whatever. If the discriminator can't tell what style the artwork is in, then the generator receives a penalty, um, a style ambiguity loss, and starts over. It's relatable, okay. Um, one of the things that these researchers emphasize is their interest in producing NPR, or non-photorealistic aesthetics. Interestingly, producing something that does not look like a photograph has almost two centuries worth of history in modern art itself. Ever since the camera was invented and began to challenge the value of artists to depict the world, artists themselves, human artists, began trying to develop something that, shall we say, could outcompete the camera and the immaculate realism of photography. So there's a certain kind of poignant aspect to these experiments in AI. Um, getting machines to imitate the style of human artists who themselves historically were lost in a rivalry, rivalry with another mechanical device, the camera, the lithograph, cinema. When we look at an expressionist artwork like this, study for improvisation eight by Vasily Panlitsky, certainly we see non-photographic realism or the absolute defiance of the mechanical camera to produce something beautiful about the world. We see something more than transcending the camera in these pictures, so something a little bit harder to talk about if modernists and technology could be said to have been locked in an adversarial game at this time, we could say that the modernists were trying to generate an art not to rival or fool the camera, but rather to confound the camera, to humble it, to claim a place that's unique and separate for the human mind and its phenomenology, to surprise, not to imitate. This is where we come to the idea of the surprising in AI creativity, one that Elgamal et al. talk about in this competition that they set up it, on sides of the network. Is it art or not? And can its style be identified? They mentioned that it's important to the generators winning its battle with the discriminator for the generator to be surprising rather than simply novel. Surprisingness is not necessarily correlated with novelty. For example, it can stem from a lack of novelty. I wanna talk about lack of novelty in the history of art now, um, but also I wanna point out this interest in surprisingness uh, is one that they get from Alan Turing. So in Alan Turing's 1950 Computing Machinery and Intelligence paper, where he outlines the Turing test, um, Turing observes here that, quote, machines take me by surprise with great frequency. It's perhaps worth remarking that the appreciation of something as surprising requires as much of a creative mental act, whether the surprising event originates from a man, a book, a machine, or anything else. In other words, simply registering that something is surprising already is a complex act and requires creative thinking. Turing says this in the context of newly post-war you know, computation. He designed the first computers, and uh, this meant Turing himself was in the room during the context of World War II in that making sure that the computers did work because they're trying to intercept uh, enemy communications and they wanted to decrypt these communications. They need to make absolutely sure the computer doesn't do something surprising in the case of an enemy code. And you know, from this context, Turing, Turing still says in Can Digital Computers Think, quote, the less doubt there is about what's going to happen, the better the mathematician is pleased and it's like planning a military operation. Under these circumstances, it's fair to say the machine doesn't originate anything. So there's some situations we don't want the machine originating, thank you very much. Turing also says, though, in this same speech, if we gave the machine a program which results in its doing something interesting, which we had not anticipated, I should be inclined to say the machine had originated something rather than to claim that its behavior was implicit in the program and therefore that the originality lies entirely with us. If it's interesting, if it's surprising, why not say the machine originated the artifact? This idea of calculating surprise, calculating surprise has been taken up, um, including, just this is just one of many different uh, studies that have been done. I chose this one because it had a really great set of examples. Um, and th these researchers find that this artificial agent is um, supposed to assess 
the possible choices of windows in creatively designing a building. So it's not just art, right? We want to get AI to do all kinds of creative things. What about design building? The artificial agent will say that a squared window is 49.38% uh, surprising. But a circular window is 59.5% surprising. Surprisingly, a rectangular window is 95.44% surprising. I don't know that I would have said that. But the most surprising of all, what do you think that is? No window. <laughs> and so the agent, uh, the AI agent that wants to maximize surprise will say, how about no window? This makes the new building more surprising, uh, maybe not the most useful or healthy. Um, and it brings us back to another problem of art in the modern and contemporary period. So that's one that engages this really, really tense interplay between the surprising and the shocking, the that's not useful, that's not healthy, and the completely non-original, you know, like the black square. In fact, non-originality has been an important aesthetic across the period of modern and contemporary art. What if we say, you know, Duchamp's fountain from Nice at Seven Thieves, and you know, you've got a urinal that becomes art just because it's displayed in a museum. Or the most recent version of this fountain <laughs> by Maurizio Catalan, uh, America 2016, a solid gold 18 karat toilet. Thanks. Um, Catalan is also the artist who taped that banana to the wall. Thank you, Nina. Um, <laughs> look at the name of this one. Um, sorry, I, at the International Art Show, Art Basel. Uh, and this banana taped to the wall was sold for $120,000. Know, it's this same kind of story, right? What are these artists doing? Why are they doing such ridiculously non-useful stuff by taping bananas to the wall? How can it be valuable? And Catalan was asked about this. What's it supposed to represent? What's it communicating? And he says, the banana is supposed to be a banana. There's no deeper meaning. It's a banana taped to the wall. It's a banana. And this provokes feeling of, is this art? I think that it's profoundly interesting because we're asking exactly these same questions of AI art. Is this art? So one argument I'm proposing is that AI creativity is getting at the paradox that modern art itself was always pushing us towards. Think, for example, about another event that shocked the art world in the same year as the de Bellamy portrait by that AI Dan. So, you know, Christie's was having a really wacky year. They were selling AI art, and then this happened. Who, who knew about this happening? Do people? Okay, right. All right. Um, all right, so just for those of you who didn't watch this pedagogical stunt, um, pedagogical for the purpose of art, this uh, was auctioned, and then as the gavel went down, uh, a hidden shredder in this, you know, preposterously huge gilt frame um, shredded the artwork, and you can see those blessed reactions. Um, so, you know, in other words, modern art and contemporary art are pushing the boundaries of what is authentic, original, rare, and, you know, destroyed. <laughs> All of these things are what gives art its value. We should be thinking about that when we think about AI. <laughs> yeah, shredding the value there. Uh, when we consider the value of machine creativity at one point, it was quite, you know, it was quite shocking that we could say make Brad Pitt and the Golden Gate Bridge be a painting by Claude Monet. But now we're, we're more used to that idea. We have those filters on our phones, right? Um, we're used to the idea that we could get a Brad Pitt photograph that to sort of look like a Van Gogh Starry Night or sort of look like Roy Lichtenstein and that we could calibrate it, you know, 0.36 Lichtenstein or whatever. Um, this one, uh, this experiment by El Gamel et al, who the same team at Rutgers, who've been at this for quite a while, and began to want to quantify the creativity in artworks and try to assess with computers how creative human artworks are. So this is one of these um, graphs that they've come up with about the history of Western art. Um, it's from 2015. Uh, as you can see by looking at where the dots cluster, and you know, we could really spend some time on this. Um, Roy Lichtenstein, if you look at that top right corner there with the kind of fruit from 1972, ends up as the most creative in 
its time period bracket. As you know, Wikistein, Wikistein did a bunch of stuff with you know, pop art. So it's interesting that that's the most creative, right? Because so much of it was about derivation. If you look at this at the bottom, who gets the worst score, right? Who gets an F? And that's Rodin and Albrecht Dürer. They get terrible scores. They get least creative. Um, we could debate this. But the, assess the assessment here of creativity measures um, whether something's very surprising or very unusual. And uh, you know, Rodin and Dürer, some revered people, um, compared to their peers and contacts, were assessed to be not surprising. But is this the only thing we need to think about? Getting to this idea of Turing, test, of Turing testing creativity, um, the authors of this 2017 study to produce AI art with that CAN, uh, Creative Adversarial Network, Turing tested their artifacts by putting them up in a competition against um, what you can see on the right of that slide. So those are human produced artworks and those were um, entrants in the Art Basel uh, International Exhibition over there. And these are on the left side, the AI ones. Okay, so they asked humans to decide which are AI, which are human. And the humans they got to do this were Amazon Mechanical Turk workers, which adds <laughs> a whole other interesting layer to this. Um, but you know, what I wanna talk about here is some of the questions that they asked in order to decide has our art AI art passed the Turing test, all right. Such as, as I interact with this painting, I start to see the artist's intentionality. It looks like it was composed very intentionally. Agree or disagree. As I interact with this painting, I start to see a structure emerging. As I interact with this painting, I feel that it is communicating with me. As I interact with this painting, I feel inspired and elevated. In this Turing test for creativity, we see some old ideas about artistic merit and aesthetics emerging. Intentionality, intentional structure, communication, and this idea of inspiration, which you know, for them has to do with a feeling of being elevated. For those of us who are interested in modern contemporary art, however, we might think that those aren't quite the aesthetics that contemporary art is going for. Um, you know, this is, these are some other art examples from that exact same uh, year of the art show, Art Basel 2016. Hmm. Uh, if we compare this to the kind of what the researchers had selected to test their AR art against, well, looking at these, we don't necessarily maybe feel inspired, nor do we necessarily see a structure emerging unless it's a very satirical structure, chaotic, hectic, absurd, preposterous even, critical, childlike, acerbic, unsettling. Art Basel in 2016, for example, featured a statue of kneeling Donald Trump, who was running for president at that time. Uh, it was put on display. Uh, this was thought to be an homage actually to that same banana taped artist, Mauricio Catalan, because Catalan had also made a kneeling sculpture of Hitler whether Donald Trump kneeling or a banana taped to a wall, yes, we get the idea of intentionality, sure, but it's a little bit more than intentionality. We may feel inspired or elevated when we look at art, but just as frequently, we may totally hate it. We may not and not feel at all inspired, and so much contemporary art is in fact trying to problematize those feelings of being inspired, leaning instead toward those that give us an unsettling feeling, maybe indignant. What's the difference between the unsettling and the disruptive? And how, for example, do we talk about this object, the golden statue of Trump that was featured at CPAC, a conservative political conference this, uh, this year? Is this an artwork? Is it an idol? How is it supposed to make us feel? Do we feel elevated? What reminiscences are we having here? So this is the final part of my talk. I wanna turn back the clock a little bit after looking at this you know, cutting edge AI poetry here. Um, and uh, Professor Johnson mentioned uh, my, my book, Apparatus Poetic. I do talk about the history of machine poetry in the Cold War in that book. Um, 
So this particular set of examples of, of AI-generated poetry generates poems you know, based on images here. Um, that's, it's all very interesting, but we can't go into it. Let's remember that even as AI poetry is presented in the headlines as cutting edge, um, it's one of the first things that people started trying to produce when they had computers available. And you know, I'm going over these quickly, but just for some background, for example, stochastic text generated by Theo Lutz in 1959. Lutz, a computer poet, is actually, he's a mathematician and dabbled in poetry here using Kafka's The Castle as the focus. Um, or the linguist Roman Jakobsen saying that there's a spectacular tie between linguistics and the mathematical analysis of stochastic processes, all the way up through uh, the ways that various kinds of mathematical thinking about poem recognition uh, try to recognize mathematically what's a poem. Can, is there a calculus for it? Um, this is an interesting study. You can look at that. And such experiments remind us of the French experimental literary group Ulipo, with their famous 10 million billion poems project, uh, 14 lines that permutate. It does look a bit like a neural network, interestingly. Um, or this 1961 project by an Italian poet, Nanni Balestrini. Uh, this was iterated on a bank computer in Milan, and it spliced together different words, including some accounts of survivors from Hiroshima. So a very interesting project. This is 1961, uh, and really this kind of experimentation has been going on for a long time. Um, another example I discuss in my book is this fantastic poem by Alison Knowles, The House of Death from 1967. So here are computer engineers at Bell Lab uh, tried basically, and this is what Margaret Bowden calls combinatorial creativity, getting these different lines to iterate only one time in this order and to produce different descriptions of strange places to live. Um, also a very interesting artwork. So this idea of poetry being written by computers is about as old as the computer itself. But it continually asks the question, what's being communicated? And poetry, of course, also problematizes the idea of communication. We have Aaron Murray's collection, for example. Uh, Aaron Murray is a Canadian poet. This one was written by Max Rose uh, and produced what she called very bad lesbian love sonnets. Or, and this is actually the subject that Nancy Gosman is mentioning and I have a chapter on uh, in that book. Uh, Christian Bach's the um, genotext experiment and that's encrypting a poem into the DNA of a living organism and having the DNA write another poem also encrypted. Okay, so coming back to AI poetry from today. If we look at a poem like this, and um, we read this, I wonder, this is produced by an AI, but let's read it. I will arise and go by the sea gate. I watch it fly and let me lie in the dark green valley and let me sing to the sun, et cetera. Um, I wonder if any of you are hearing William Butler Yeats and Innisfree, yes. <laughs> right? This, in fact, <laughs> this AI was trained on Yeats. Um, I will arise and go now and go to in the spree, etc. People who study literature immediately hear that echo. Otherwise, it just looks random. Well, what does the echo mean? Such AI poetry is not too far from problematic scandals, such as the Forgado Collective Algorithm, in the fall of 2008, and this is when I realized I wanted this as part of my book, um, <laughs> this book came out, I'm also a poet, and the poetry world was really upset because a book had been published saying that it had all these poems from you know, people like Ethan Alloy or contemporary poets from today. They're all collected in one anthology. And all these poets started writing in to the editor saying, you know, hi there, this is terribly strange. My name appears in the contributors list. Um, a poem I've never written, nor do I know who the author, nice poem, but not me. Is this some hypertext performance piece? What's the reaction you want? Have we met? Was I drunk? For now, kindly remove my name. And of course, all of these were written by an algorithm. Um, and you know, here, a kind of background by Vanessa Place. Vanessa Place did not write this. Uh, a kind of wonder, a kind of mica, a kind of background. I think it's good. Or, or this poem, allegedly by Mina Loy, like an English inducing harm of recognition. You get it. It's an interesting poem there. 
uh, the collection, as you might imagine, made professional poets angry. It's not that it had plagiarized their work. It had plagiarized what their work is like. That's very interesting. <laughs> um, how far does property extend there? Okay, so here's this final poem that I want to look at, written by a poem producing CAM, CAM. And now I am tired of my own. Let me be the freshening blue, haunted through the sky there and cold water. Warm blue air shimmering, brightly never arrived, seems to say. Well, as an English professor, I'd say that's not too bad, actually. Um, brightly never arrived, it seems to say. And there's something about the never arriving of this AI creativity that I find really fascinating. And it might be a property of creativity itself. I wonder if any of you have seen this website, thispersondoesnotexist.com. Anybody? Okay, some people have. Great. You know, this is this website kills me to my core, and I love it. Um, the website, so go check it out if you haven't. It uses um, AI to generate photographs of people out of the corpus, and it's been trained on the corpus of other, you know, photographs of actual people. But none of these people exist. None of them not only do not exist, it generates them only once. So you click, you see the picture, and then you click again, and that picture disappears. It's not saved. You know, so you can see this young woman um, looking nice. The, there's some decorations that the AI has placed in maybe, maybe quirky, asymmetric places at the top of her forehead. But, you know, you could say, oh, that, that person exists. Um, but if you click through enough, you start looking for the ways it messes up. Here, I didn't see this, but part of it's the glasses just sort of aren't there. If you look at the patterning on the suit, it's kind of missing. And something, I, you know, of course, I wanted to go read the research paper that this was um, based, that this was sort of promoting. It's by a team at NVIDIA. Um, and they talk about some of the features and how the, you know, how this particular GAN learns to produce these. They say that one of the problems is that the GAN will forget to move some of the features as these faces shift, and they call this phase artifact. So the smile might stay here and the face moves, and the smile doesn't move. Um, so it looks perhaps to have discovered cubism. Um, AI seems to be rediscovering everything in the history of art. Some of these photographs have uh, very uncanny things as well, like this face that's next to the young woman, which seems to be kind of bulging in an uncanny way. Sort of like the AI thought, I don't really need to render that. Or, or this face, the woman looks fine, but what's next to her in this photograph, right? And remember, this is generated, a generated part of a face. It doesn't look right. <laughs> and um, what we see in all these images, please go to the website, you'll find that a spell comes over you, I think. I found that when I was looking at these non-photographic photographs, I find myself marveling. Not only does this person not exist, but something's being created for one time only. It gives you a sense of mortality. When you look into sunglasses like this, you see that AI has created nothing looking back at you nothing reflected in those sunglass frames, and you get a very strange feeling. I would argue that's the feeling a lot of contemporary art wants to create. So it seems AI will be unsettling us for many years to come. Thank you. Look forward to the questions.
Yeah, I mean, so the question was about, I'm repeating the question for the, for the recording. Um, the question was about uh, why do NFTs have so much value? Why does simply having a public proof of ownership give it value? Yeah, I mean, that's exactly the kind of thing that I think is on that continuum between what we think is maybe new now, oh, NFT art, it's so new, but that's exactly on the continuum with, I'm the only one that owns this particular Van Gogh and it's in my art vault and you can't see it, right? So it is that idea, the, one of the problems with digital art was, well, so I make something on you know, Microsoft Paint and it's the best thing I've ever made, but then you know, millions of people can have that file and it's worth zero, right? So with the NFT, you've only got this one, this one file. So it has value simply because it's the only one. And that itself, right, it seems like it's a technological story. This is why I'm interested in it and maybe why you're interested in it. It seems like it's a story about technology. It's, it's, a, sto it's a story about property, again. It's a story about art, again. For any of you who have read things like Walter Benjamin's Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproducibility, where Benjamin talks about art having an aura, right? It has this if you have the Mona Lisa, it's just that one Mona Lisa. There is no other Mona Lisa until it has an aura. But digital art couldn't have that until now. But then have we really changed anything, right? And so in some ways we've moved in reverse. Um, we've moved back to the one and only digital collage. <laughs> um, does that answer your question or do you want to do a follow up on that? Yes. Yeah, and you know, it does get back to there's art as a site of creativity and then there's art as a site of property. And when it becomes that site of property, it's about not sharing in a way, right? So I'm not gonna share this, I'm gonna own it. And what happens to creativity when creativity moves away from sharing? And so thinking about that kind of thing. So it's an open question for the future, but that's why I'm interested in it as a, um, yeah. And I have actually been interested in NFT gaming, which is a new thing if anyone's looking into that. But I can't talk about it because I don't have enough knowledge at this time. Um, Okay, this is a very complicated question. So first I wanna bracket that you said what happens as AI gets closer to human intelligence. And that's one thing I'm really interested in, right? If AI gets closer to our intelligence, will that get us closer to, will that get AI closer to creativity, to art? Like how are those two things connected? And that's a whole topic. Um, you're also asking, well, when AI can produce these great art works, What's it gonna do to the human production, right? And one of the things that some AI, not all, but some AI researchers who kind of create this kind of technology, they say, well, there's a, high, there's a high demand for creative products. And so we need to develop a technology that can produce on a massive scale for something there's a big demand for in the market. We, we have demands, you know, I wanna give someone a birthday card and I'll generate a unique card, right? For that is not too weird and has this kind of aesthetic, okay, you can imagine how economically lucrative this would be. Um, but then there's this sort of the Christie's auction type of art, right? And there's also the history of art type of art that I've been talking about, like Duchamp. Um, and this is what I find really interesting is that as AI art tries to promote itself toward you know, Christie's and high modernism or whatever, it gets into that part of art, which if you've study the history of art, is all about disruption value. So it's almost like unawares, people designing AI to make art are walking themselves right into a problem, which is that art tries to say, screw value, right? Screw, like, screw anything that's recognizably 
um, the Mona Lisa, which has been kind of the history of art for the last 150 years. Um, that's, I think, it's, it's sort of funny in a way, but it's also really interesting. And as somebody who works with modernism and late modernism, um, you know, so many of the things that those artists are saying about what art is supposed to do to us has to do with how art makes us feel strange, makes us feel uncomfortable, makes us question ourselves. And we don't usually think, oh, AI, IBM, AI, whatever. Those research scientists aren't saying, let's develop an AI that can make us question ourselves, right? They're, that's not sort of the idea. But if we're going to end up producing art that is being sold at Christie's, it might make us question ourselves. So this is, this is Bernie Lepeda. Write it down. I totally love that, and I'm going to try to repeat this back for the recording, but um, wow, fantastic question. Okay, so uh, what about the emphasis on embodied symbolic capital versus possessive or possessed symbolic capital? Um, I'll pause there uh, because you've asked me about the different value structures that I've highlighted in the talk. Um, where do I think AI is operating? I think that AI could operate in quite a number of spheres. What I'm noticing is where it's being asked to operate. So that's what I wanted to talk about is, well, let's put it on a quest for creativity, but we wanna make sure that it disrupts rather than unsettles us, right? Um, where we want AI to produce art that will create a lot of money in a totally overdetermined art market, you know, right? This is already set up and going before AI enters the scene. Um, but, you know, and maybe, I'm not sure if you, if you meant for me to think about embodiment in the way I'm going to, so ask your follow-up if I'm not getting that right. But one thing you, one thing you reminded me of is Jackson Pollock. And you know, the thing with Jackson Pollock's drip paintings, and famously, 
people, when they first saw Jackson Pollock's, you know, paintings of drips and splotches, they said, well, this isn't art, right? This is the thing that modern art continues to provoke, is this art? And you can look at these paintings now and say, oh, you know, it's so valuable, right? This in ex machina, this, the, the tech guy has a Jackson Pollock in the basement in his lab, right? It's like Jackson Pollock. Um, now we see it as valuable, and we can tell that story. But you know, the thing with the Jackson Pollock is that Jackson Pollock was holding a paintbrush in, in his body, right? His, the movement of his arm can also be seen in the paintings. You can see the radius of the human arm moving across the painting, and that's part of the painting. So when you said embodied capital, and I don't, tell me if this isn't what you wanted to get at, but AI doesn't have a body. <laughs> and one of the things that I'm interested in is the phenomenology that AI is working with when it's training on certain you know, data sets. We don't really talk about AI as having a phenomenology. I think we should. Uh, we don't talk about AI as having senses. We probably should, but we don't. Um, AI doesn't have a body yet. But if it does, does, does it need a body to create art? And that's one thing I'm interested in, right? Will an AI need to be in a robot body before it can want to create art? Is the body involved in art in some way that we haven't appreciated? Because all of these things that I've been showing you are very just disembodied reproductions, you know, pixels reproducing texture and not kind of thinking about the body. So that's one part of your question. The other part, yes. Right, right. Hmm. You know, I mean, I think in some ways, and your second part of your question was pointing to the feedback loop that we get into with our technologies, right? And um, so that we can talk about that in a, in a sort of phenomenological way, as well as in the way of like, well, I've learned some habits to value this, right? Which is, I think, what you're talking about. And also, I've learned through the habits of engaging with whatever algorithm on Spotify or whatever, that I don't get as many, um, I don't get as much uptake of my production, whether it's music or whatever, if I do these kinds of chord progressions. And so you get into this feedback. And I guess one thing I wanna say uh, in this talk and elsewhere is that we're already in this feedback loop and that AI is just intensifying it because um, because, well, that's a whole other talk in itself, it does have certain capacities that we think are the capacities only we have. One of the things that I didn't mention in some of these uh, research pieces I was talking about is not only will they test AI art, they'll also test art done by animals. And, you know, because animals have a body, they have a phenomenology, but we say they can't create art. Now, for those of you who like the elephant paintings, I'm sorry, many people say it's not art, I don't, but, <laughs> you know, they wanted to test okay, can people tell if it's an elephant painting and they can't tell if it's an AI painting because if they can't tell it's an AI painting, then we've surpassed not only the human test, but also like this couldn't have been done by an animal. And you know, I'm just so interested in this boundary, you know, gatekeeping around who can be creative and not thinking about what like you're suggesting here, which is that we're so influenced and deeply determined by the technological systems that we've set up they are working on us. We don't sit and decide, right, oh, the history of music, here's what is gonna be the good music, and then we'll get our AI and our algorithms to replicate that. It's working on us too, right? So, um, and, you know, I, I totally left music out of the talk, but it is a really, like, Emmy by Douglas Cope, by Cope, 
um, who invented a, a music uh, AI to produce Bach and various classical artists, and quite successfully, David Cope? I think it's David Cope. Um, and then people got so upset because the Bach that this AI was producing was really, really good. And so he deleted the entire archive. Like people were actually upset. They're like, don't make more Bach. You've diluted the whole corpus. And he got so much kind of hate that he said, oh, I didn't mean to do that. And he deleted the whole thing. So that itself, I think, is so interesting in a whole other talk. I'm sorry I had to leave that part out. But uh, thanks for such an interesting question. Um, Well, I'll tell you my personal opinion, and the question is, for those of you on the record of the future, <laughs> the question is, um, what if AI accidentally produces something at the level of Shakespeare, at the level of you know, Rembrandt or whatever? Um, well, I think that would be fantastic, right? <laughs> and I don't see why that couldn't happen, um, except for the fact of you know, entropy and heat death arriving eventually, so that that computer that will type out, you know, Hamlet may have to wait till the end of the universe when the proton beam sinks in, but, um, right, I mean, one of the things that is so fascinating when you think of monkeys or whatever, a computer typing on a typewriter forever, is how long it probably will take to produce Hamlet, whereas Shakespeare did it in, you know, six months, right? And how was it that Shakespeare did that? It wasn't by kind of combinatorial intelligence where Shakespeare just put together a bunch of words. Shakespeare was working with what language meant and what life meant at the time, and so had a much smaller search base, right? Um, so, and just to, I guess, really end this answer to the question, although you've asked such a rich question, it's hard to finalize the answer, but I would really, really love it if AI would first make itself known as AGI by, you know, making art instead of, I don't know, solving some complex, you know, millennium math problem or whatever, right? Like that would actually be really great. Um, but, you know, one thing, and this was more at the beginning of the talk, we are very bad at appreciating <laughs> creativity. We're very bad at that. And so I think it's possible AI is already making revolutionary art and we're like, well, that's bad. And we never see it because it didn't get past the discriminator in the GAN, you know? <laughs> like, we don't know. Um, so that's sort of my answer to that. That's an interesting question. So the question is, did Sophia the robot need a body to be what Sophia was under it, right? Is that, okay. You know, as many of us maybe also remember from that particular moment, Sophia the robot was declared a citizen of a country, right? And I think Sophia needed a body to be a citizen. Um, and you know, the body is like rooting us in all kinds of discourses of power all the time. And we don't think, uh, enough maybe about how the body is opening us up to other things that are not yet controlled, right? Like, and this is where I'm always trying to think about how the body asks us to create art. You know, and it's not the, the question about intelligence earlier. This is for me the really, really important one. The body and intelligence together are making art. And somehow AI, <laughs> artificial intelligence, is thought to be oh yeah, well, it will create. What's the link there though? And do we need the body? And so the question like, 
I mean, maybe you don't need the body to create art. I'm not sure. There's, a, there's an essay by a philosopher named Jean Francois Lyotard who asks, can thought go on without a body? Because Lyotard isn't even sure that we can think without a body, that we can philosophize without a body. Um, and Lyotard, who's writing in the 80s, says, you're not gonna get AI until you can make the computer suffer. That seems to art as well, right? When we think about AI, uh, that art comes out of suffering, it also comes out of pleasure, it also comes out of love, right? And you know, all these things, uh, what makes us create art, right? Of course we could think, whatever Beeple was doing, I don't know, I don't wanna judge Beeple, I'm sure he was doing, but you know, what makes us do 5,000 drawings? I'm less interested in the NFT aspect of Beeple and more interested in, why are you doing 5,000 drawings? Every day you're doing one drawing, that's amazing. But <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of my answer to it. But, mm -hmm. Uh, the question is, um, have AI designers thought that they might need to create sort of the life of John Keats, not only the first sonnets, but the last, right? The idea of development in AI art. What a cool idea. I think they should do that. And, you know, I mean, right now I was, I teach at the University of Toronto and I was just teaching Foucault's What is an Author to my undergrads. Um, and in Foucault's What is an Author, which could connect to What is an Artist, right? Uh, Foucault thinks about that moment when someone's moved beyond, I'm just producing a piece of writing to I've produced something, a really good piece of writing, now I'm an author. But then the next thing that happens after being an author is being an author function. And for, for Foucault, the author function goes with authors who kind of transcend, yeah, I wrote this thing, and become like their own style or their own school of thought, for example, Freud, Marx, Nietzsche, whatever. Um, could we have an author function for AI? <laughs> and so in that, you know, and to, to take up, and I'm just sort of improvising on your question, which I find so interesting, um, that the idea that AI would want to update itself, but also make available something to everyone else to come in on, right? That it would be an author function for us, that we might want to paint in the style of this person does not exist.com or whatever, right? That, that it would be collaborative because art's collaborative. We wanna see that biography of the artist because we like seeing the artist learn what else they wanna do because it reminds us of what else we wanna do, right? And so yeah, I, I totally like that question. Thank you for that. Um, we should do it. Someone in this room, do that. <laughs> Right, I mean, and that, we can decide it either way. So I suppose that's why I wanted to have that discussion very briefly of Robbie Barrett, because this story about the, um, this artist collective, Obvious Collective, that made the Ed Edmond de Bellamy painting, that they said, oh well, you give away our rights to say that we made this. It's here, it's the, the painting is signed by this formula, right? So they seem to be given, but then it turns out that they kind of plagiarized, but the code was open source, so what's the ethics of that? Okay, and so, you know, really we'll have to change our whole understanding of the property structure surrounding art before we can even get beyond that as an important question, but so far we still need to ask that question, right? I mean, we could say, okay, well, humans made that formula, they made the computer, so humans ultimately made whatever. Um, but the, I don't know. I mean, I want to push the question a little bit, but I do see what you're saying there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's that's right. And I think the fact that the AI, the one other reason I wanted to emphasize surprising this so much, even for Alan Turing, is we don't know what it's gonna make. And any of you in this room who are artists, you're gonna sit down, you're gonna make something, you're gonna stand up, you're gonna make something. You don't necessarily know, right? You know, but you don't know. And that's the fun of art. Um, so I think that surprisingness is involved for us and it's involved for AI as well. So that's my two bullets. Yes, great question. Um, how can AI not get caught in a feedback loop where it's too derivative of us? Is the short. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that is an absolute problem. And I think if we design AI selfishly, anthropocentrically, whatever, we are going to get that spiraling derivation that you just talked about um, on both sides of the equation, which you've pointed out already so beautifully. You know, like. Music is already getting impoverished in some way. And well, let's worry also that AI might have something more to tell us than what it's borrowed in your terms from our experience. I love that. And you know, to go to this question about the typewriter, right? What if AI you know, can see in infrared and is painting in infrared and we can't see it, right? Like as an allegory. We're, maybe we're not gonna even know all the things that AI wants to express. That's at the, of course the edge that can't be in the talk. But I do say, I want, I want to say that AI challenges us in a way we've almost arrived at the end of this, you know, history of humans unsettling humans in contemporary art and moved into machines unsettling humans. And that's for me where the real interest is. And I, I quite love the way you, you framed this, so thank you. I love all these questions about feedback. Will AI art be feeding back? I might have missed some of that, but will AI art be feeding back into what AI art thinks needs to be made? Yes, right? And we see this happening with machine translation, actually. So machine translation, which began with statistical machine translation, was actually looking at all the things that got translated it for the EU by humans, and then putting them, making Google Translate, et cetera. But now there's been so many machine translations put up online that the corpus for machine translation is other machine translation. So there's to that point. Um, but this art question is hard uh, because so I'd need to think about what kind of AI is trained, right? Because all the AIs are designed differently, right? But if you have two AIs, as you're saying, I'm assuming both trained on the same data set in the same exact, and they have the same programming with the same data sets, would they produce the exact same art? I mean, that's probably a question for a technician because it depends on if you randomize the way that the neural network is doing the uptake and sending the error signals and back propagating whatever it's going on, right? Um, but, uh, you know, one of the things that is always so important is the kind of the swerve, as it were, the, the, the moment of chance that comes into even just how, like, these, you know, how, how many, this AI hasn't seen enough side of the face kind of 
right? There's a paucity of information that you can see has designed that weird space there. Um, so will they produce the same thing? It's not usually that deterministic, but like, then we get to the question, could they produce the same thing? That's probably its, its own difficult question. Um, but yes, training sets are crucial here. <laughs> Uh, thanks.